if I want to transport those through my waveguide, they should not be absorbed by the material. So the material should be transparent at that wavelength. That's the way that I select the material. So now let's go back to the periodic table. I pick what's called calcogenide glasses. What are calcogenide glasses? Well, they're not the window glasses that we use normally. They are specific glasses that are made out of these calcogen elements, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, bonded with, say, gallium, germanium, antimony, and so on. But the reason we use these glasses are manifold. And let me go through one by one. The first reason is, if you look at this, the purple line here, it shows the transparency of these calcogenide glasses all the way in the electromagnetic spectrum from ultraviolet, visible, near IR, mid IR, far IR. You can see that this is transparent all the way from visible to about far IR. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a waveguide which is transparent in the infrared. So this is why I picked calcogenide glasses. Another interesting feature is look how many elements I have that I can juggle. So I now have flexibility. If I want to choose antimony, I can. If I want to choose germanium, I can. If I want to mix and match, I can. So there is my palette from my periodic table. I can mix and match materials and elements to make calcogenide glass waveguides. So that's another advantage. Lastly, this is what I was talking about, the functional group region and the fingerprint region. This is the fingerprint region, and this is the functional group region. And that is what gives you a fingerprint of the sense of the gas. I talked about methane, I talked about butane and propane. All of these gases have different signatures, photonic signatures. They absorb at different wavelengths of light. Okay. Is that clear, or is there any doubt about that? No? If you have any questions, please interrupt, because I don't know what you don't know. Right? So you have to let me know. Yes. Uh, depending. No, no. Mid IR is a band. Yes. All the way from, say, 3 to 5 to 6 microns. All of this is called mid IR. And over here, they call it either far IR or LWIR, which is long wave infrared. Then this is your near IR, which is where all your telecommunications, you pick up a phone and you call, that's all near IR. 1.5 micron is telecommunication band, that region. And then, of course, you have the visible light, and then ultraviolet light, and so on. And then if you go further down, you go into microwave, and so on. So that electromagnetic spectrum, I'm talking about a band of wavelengths. And many of our chemicals, any in the world, natural chemicals that you find, have their functional group regions, OH bond, CH bond, NO, SO, they all absorb in that wavelength range. So when you talk about making sensors specific, everyone talks about infrared light as the best way to find out what chemical there is. So that's the, those are the three reasons which I'm summarizing here. The wide infrared transparency window of calcogenide glasses in purple here. The tunable optical properties, look at how many elements in the periodic table I can pick from. And then the ease of fabrication. This part is because I'm going to use silicon to make my sensors. I'm going to make it on silicon. So everybody knows how to make stuff on silicon. It's very commonplace now because the, for the last 50 years or so, almost all chips, electronic chips are made on silicon. So now, when I do my photonics on the silicon, I'm leveraging everything that is known in the world today on silicon fabrication. So ease of fabrication is the last benefit. I'll say a little bit about fabrication. So this is a big word, lift-off fabrication process, but it's really easy. How many of you, you are all very young here, you probably just use digital cameras, but some of you may also know what the old-fashioned cameras were, were with the film in it. You're aware of that? You had to go take a picture and go and develop it in a dark room and then come back and look at it? Well, ultraviolet light lithography or UV lithography is very similar. And the photographic film is nothing but what we call photoresist. And this is just a specific type of photoresist, 
which is NR9 or negative resist, which means when I shine light through some barrier on the resist, whatever part does not see the light gets washed away in the developer. Okay? So it's just like developing a film. But here what we do is we make patterns for sensors. This is how we fabricate our sensors. And here's an image on this side of how that pattern looks. It's actually a cross-sectional microscope image after we fabricated the device. Now, once we do this, we then deposit our calcogenite glasses. Our, our students have developed a very nice way to deposit these glasses through the openings. And right there in blue is the calcogenite glass. In red is your photoresist. And then when you put it into acetone, it just lifts off the red part. The red part, which is photoresist, if you dip it in acetone, it lifts it off, leaving behind your blue region, which is what you want, which is your sensor. And this sensor looks like this. The waveguide on top, and they have a thermal oxide underneath, which is a cladding material. And then the sensor device is the circle that I talked about. Any, any doubts about how liftoff fabrication actually works? It's not, uh, it's not difficult. It's actually quite easy. So once you've fabricated the sensor, how do we use it? Can we use it in sensing gas, perhaps in sensing methane? So now I'll talk about on-chip methane gas sensing. That's my sensor, actually. We make spiral sensors rather than just a circle. Any idea on why we make a spiral? Increases the surface of interaction of light. So path length of interaction of light with the chemical increases. If you imagine that there's some methane gas around here, the more time my light has to interact with the methane, the more sensitive my signal will be that comes out at the other end. I put light here, I measure light here. Whatever happens here is reflected in my ultimate signal that I get over here. So the longer this path length of interaction between light and the chemical, the methane gas, the better my signal-to-noise ratio. Is that clear? Yeah, OK. So I use a spiral. And here's the data from that spiral. Transmittance as a function of wavelength. Whenever you plot anything as a function of wavelength, you call it a spectrum. So here, the spectrum is showing that at a wavelength of 3310 nanometers or 3.3 microns of light, I find that transmittance dips. That means there's some absorption going on. This means that whichever gas has its absorption at that wavelength is present on my sensor. And that gas happens to be methane. What's more convincing is when you increase the concentration of methane all the way from 0 to 100%, my transmittance goes down. As more and more gas is there to absorb the light away, I see less and less light at the end of my sensor. So that is another indication that I do have methane when I'm making this measurement. So this is the actual part of sensing. It's not that difficult. It's just how does light interact with the chemical and how do we monitor that interaction. So we have shown on-chip detection of methane gas using absorption. Now, using absorption, as I said before, is very helpful because that is your fingerprint. That is your selectivity. It is not just some gas is present on the sensor, but it tells you methane gas is present on the sensor. That is quite important here. Now, we've talked about gas sensing. How about detection? Remember that last circle that I had? We have to have a detector on chip. And I'm going to talk about a waveguide integrated detector. You can talk about having a detector somewhere on the side on the table. That works too. However, if I was thinking about it, I want to minimize my noise. Somehow, I want to get lowest noise possible. If you're listening to music, and if you have your music source in your hall, and you're away in the kitchen with all the noise of the taps and so on in the cooking, you hear it less. If you move closer and closer to your radio or your speaker, you hear it better and better. The music is clearer. Same way with 
integrated detectors. If your detector is far away from the end of your spiral, you're going to get noise somehow from everywhere else. If you bring that detector closer and closer to your sensing element, chances of suppressing the noise and getting better signal-to-noise ratios and better measurements are good. So that's what we do. For that, here's what we did. Our light source comes in here through our waveguide, and this is one arm of the waveguide, and we designed it with two arms. One arm is used for alignment of the optics, and the other arm is on a detector. That purple thing you see there is a lead telluride detector. And lead telluride happens to be a very good element that absorbs the light. What you see in red doesn't absorb the light. That's a calcogenide glass that is actually transparent. And that transports the light from here to here. Here somewhere, the detection is happening. And here's where the, uh, the sensing is happening. And here's where detection of the photocurrent or photovoltage is happening. So I have my two metal contacts. They measure how has this light changed. If I, if I have methane gas or if I don't have methane gas, how is the signal different? And that difference is what we measure. And we found that when we do this, it works out very nicely. Here is a microscope image of exactly this region where we have the waveguide sitting on top of the detector and two metal electrodes on either side. When we fabricated this with our lithography steps, we find this is what it looks like, metal, metal, and the waveguide. And now if you blow this region up further, here's what we find. Nice, smooth, clean metal contacts on either side and the waveguide transition. So we made very good devices. It's all very good. We can see that it looks nice. But how does it perform? Let's look at the performance of our detector. Does it suppress noise? Is it a good infrared photonic circuit? So let's go to the detector performance. And here's the waveguide integrated lead telluride detector. That's a mouthful. Can anyone tell me what comes to your mind when I say waveguide integrated detector? Someone from back here? So the first year students wear blue and the second year wear red. Is that the uniform? No? Everybody can answer then. Why, why do we care? What does a waveguide integrate? What is integration? Integration means it's on a chip. Waveguide is something that brings light. So here's my waveguide bringing light, and it's integrated with a detector, which means I'm building my detector as close as possible as I can to the waveguide. So that's what a waveguide integrated detector is. And here's the data that comes out of it. The photocurrent that I measure as the power to that waveguide increases, you see that the photocurrent also increases. So as, if there's more light going through the detector, my photocurrent is higher. And this one here says that across a band of wavelengths, as you talked about, that photocurrent signal is valid. I see the response all the way across many different colors of photons. So now the question is, does my waveguide integrated detector, where I brought the detector close to my sensor, does it work better than if the detector is just detecting the light from the sensor from a distance? The answer is yes, very much so. And here's the data to prove it. In our lab, we measured almost three orders of magnitude improvement in uh, the responsivity, amps per watt, was one amp per watt. You may think that's very small. It's very measurable, trust me. The 0 0.017, not so measurable. And that's what happens when you have no waveguide integrated detection. You have your detector here, and you have your signal coming here. When you bring them both very close to each other, so close that they're microns away, from even less than microns away, you get, oops, you get very good waveguide integrated responsivity. Also, the quantum efficiency is almost an order of magnitude better, maybe two orders of magnitude better. And the key is it works at room temperature. Why am I bothered about working at room temperature versus, say, minus 60 Celsius? Why do detectors need to be cooled, especially infrared detectors? Any thoughts? Why do detectors need to be cooled? Your camera is a detector. Your cell phone is a detector. 
you don't cool it, you don't put it in the refrigerator, you don't add cooling to it, it still works. But why do I have to cool my detector at the infrared wavelength? Yeah, exactly. The reason is that all of us here in the room are emitting infrared light. The lights here are emitting infrared light. You and I cannot see it, but it's there. The heat that you feel is nothing but infrared light in the same wavelength that we are trying to detect methane gas. So, what do you see? Noise. If you cool your detector, then the only signals that it picks up is the signal that's coming through the waveguide. All the extra signals that come from everywhere else are too weak. They do not generate a signal. This is why infrared detectors, especially longer wavelength infrared detectors, need to be cool. We all give out infrared light that can be a source of noise. So this is why it's very, very useful that we can make room temperature infrared detection happen. Now I'll say a little bit about how am I doing for time? I have how many minutes? 15 minutes? Okay. 35. So I can go for another half an hour? Okay, fine. So uh, um, don't be alarmed. I won't talk all the 35 minutes. I'll talk less. Um, but this is, this is uh, yeah. So now that I've shown you with waveguide integrated detection, you can actually make a very high quality detector. The question is, can I do any better than this? And the answer is, of course, yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about it. So the way to improve that even further is to put my detector, which is shown here in black, within a mirror cavity. What you see here, a stack of films here and a stack of films here, is nothing but a mirror. If you take two, two stacks of dielectric materials, they actually form a mirror for certain wavelengths. And in our case, mid-infrared wavelengths. So here's my lead telluride or my detector material. I get the light in. And now the light goes back and forth multiple times between here and here, multiple bounces. So what happens is due to the fact that the light bounces multiple times, almost all the light is absorbed. So now I'm enhancing my detection because I'm not letting the light escape. I'm capturing it between these two mirrors. And that effect is called a resonant cavity enhancement. This structure is called a resonant cavity because light resonates or goes up and down many times, bounces back and forth through the mirrors. So now we actually went ahead and made resonant cavity stacks of lead telluride. And first of all, it's a low temperature fabrication process for other reasons that I won't go into. It's very helpful. And here is a schematic of our design with the top mirror and bottom mirror. And this is an scanning electron microscope image of exactly what we had designed. You see the top mirror, you see the bottom mirror, and right there is the lead telluride. So you see that it's maintained its integrity after we've developed it, after we've fabricated it. And here is what it looks like, the reflectance spectrum. Remember I said anything plotted against wavelength is called a spectrum. When you shine light on this structure, everything gets reflected except for this band of wavelengths that we are interested in. Just ignore that part for now because we designed it for this area. Everything else is reflected except this part. And that's the resonant cavity feature. So now imagine that all the light that comes here, only certain band of light between 3 and 5 microns gets through, goes up and down many, many times, many reflections, gets fully absorbed in this lead telluride layer and enhances our signal. That's what we are expecting. Is that what we see? The answer is yes, we do. Here is a plot of responsivity as a function of wavelength, how my detector responds for different wavelengths, and see how these open circles that you see here are when you just have lead telluride sitting by itself. When I put that lead telluride inside of such a cavity, with the top mirror stack and bottom mirror stack, it's asymmetric. And that's been designed on purpose. We won't get into that, but it is a mirror stack. So light bounces back and forth, absorbs, it gets absorbed by the lead telluride, and voila, look at that. The signal in that wave band 
has gone up by tenfold. And this is what we want. We want enhanced signal, which we get by putting it into a resonant cavity. <coughs> 100 volts per watt as opposed to 10 volts per watt. Quite a big difference between no resonant cavity and with resonant cavity. So these are ideas that one develops. You know what the problem is. You look for solutions. This morning, I was getting a tour of your college, and I noticed that you have wonderful labs for designing. You come up with a problem in a project, and you say, I, I really need to solve this problem of um, low power for an airplane. You know, it has to be lightweight. It has to fit in a box. I, I got a tour of, of, the, of the, um, the lab there. All of these are problems, and you come up with some ideas to solve those problems. And that's what we did. We realized that there's a problem with low signal. How do we improve the signal? We put it in a cavity. All right. So we can also build a dual. Yes, go ahead. <coughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So you don't want all the light to be trapped there forever. Um, and also, you want to allow some light to go in in the first place. So we have that asymmetry between the top and the bottom mirror. Exactly. So you cannot make just one. You can even detect multiple wavelengths. And I'll not go into the details. Oops, I didn't show that. I took that out, which is good in a way. Uh, we can make dual wavelength, more than one wavelength detection in a single pixel. Last night, I was going over the slides with my sister-in-law and brother-in-law who are non-scientists. Or, you know, they, know, they understand science, but not my kind of work. And they said, don't bore the students. Get rid of that slide. Move on. So that's why I took their advice, and I took that out. I beg Yes, yes, we have a patent for that. Um, so in the oil and gas industry, there's, there's a Sloan School of Management, just like Sayadri School uh, College has engineering and management, so also in MIT, we have an engineering school and we have the management school. So some of the management students came up to us and every year we have courses that we teach where engineering students and management students tackle a problem together. Now, do you folks also work together with each other with different departments and different backgrounds? Yes. Always it helps to have more minds solve a problem. And if you come from different backgrounds, all the better because you bring your own expertise to the table. So interdisciplinary problem solving is the best way to go. And that's what we did. We got the management team. We explained to them the problem that the oil and gas industry is facing. Today, for example, let's say you want to do pipeline leakage monitoring. There are miles and miles and miles of oil and gas pipelines in every country. Now think about it. If there's a leak, how do you detect it? How does one find it? Any thoughts on how today leaks are detected? Somebody back here, you're still awake? Show me your awake. <laughs> how do you think if there's a leak in your house in some pipeline, how would you detect it? Hmm? Sensors. Smell, yes, of course, smell. Now, can you imagine walking around miles of pipeline trying to smell if there's any oil and gas leak? That's kind of difficult to do. But you're right. You're very close. People still send people to make the measurement. So human beings are still the sensors. They have their sensing rods, but they still have to walk along the pipeline to detect if there's a problem or there's a hole or a leak somewhere. Now, that doesn't sound very efficient in this day and age, does it? So what we offered to them, our Sloan students offered to them, was here's an integrated photonic sensor. Do you think you can use it in your oil and gas leak detection? Would you be able to tell us what are your requirements so that we can go back to our engineers and tell them to make those kinds of sensors so you can use it? And they came back with a list of requirements for us. The requirements were they want very, very sensitive detectors, between 10 to 200 parts per million of leaks must be detectable. Also, there should be high selectivity. I spoke about this fingerprint. If I know that some gas is leaking, 
somewhere, that's of no use to me. That knowledge is not in information. I can't do much with it. But if I can say that at this XYZ location in space, I have a leak of methane gas, I can send a team of people right there to fix it. So that's what they want, high selectivity and low false positive. Low false positive means suddenly some alarm goes off and you go in there and you find, oh, actually there was no leak, sorry, go back. So that raises cost, you want to minimize that. Low power consumption. If you put these sensors on a pipeline, can you imagine if you have to change the batteries every two days? It's not solving anything. It might as well send the guy with his little rod to make the measurement, right? So we need low power consumption, high selectivity with low false positive, and high, highly sensitive detection. These are the conditions that the companies said us engineers should find a solution for, okay? So they gave our solution to them, and the, they did a study along with the company executives, and here's what they found. The net present value as a function of the number of years. Some of you are engineers here, maybe most of you are engineers, but the business school students like to talk in dollars. So this is what they told us. In about three years, you get paid back whatever you invest in building all these sensors the network of sensors. So three years it takes to get payback. In 10 years, you get savings of up to $5 billion. So of course there's an advantage to putting our sensors into the oil and gas pipeline for detection of leaks. There are many other examples. For example, this was one example that pipeline leak detection with integrated photonic sensors is useful. So now I have this image with a lot of our sensors along the network. You may not see it, so I had to point it out. Also in medical diagnostics, for example, the total market for prostate-specific antigen tests to detect whether or not someone has prostate cancer, the amount, the cost today is very high, and it goes to uh, the total market value for these PSA sensors is close to one point. 1753 1, million or about two billion dollars. So there's a large market for these test kits that are used and photonic sensors can be a solution, low cost solution. How many of you heard about the NTPC blast recently in Raibareli? No? Yeah, you heard about that, right? So in Raibareli in Uttar Pradesh in November, I believe November 1st or 2nd, there was a huge blast and this was caused by fans malfunctioning. Now, if the fans are malfunctioning, you need to be told ahead of time. You need somebody to be aware that the fans were malfunctioning so people don't go the next day and get killed in a blast like this. Almost 30 to 35 people ki were killed on that day. So you can save lives if you have sensors that can detect when something is malfunctioning. Another thing is snakes. There was a study that showed farmers in every country where there are poisonous snakes. For example, in India, there are very many poisonous snakes. In southern US, there are some poisonous snakes. Thermal imaging can be used to alert farmers not to walk in regions where there's a snake's nest. So that's another way to save lives, is using thermal imaging which is nothing but photonic sensors, again. So now, if I were to ask the question, GOP sensor, which I started my talk with, then I would say, definitely, I got integrated photonic sensors. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions whatsoever? 